We're excited as we continue digging in to the book of Esther. And a um, couple things on the way here. The song came on. Uh, people get ready. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And how we don't live for this world, but we live for the future. And then the scripture came to my mind that all things were written in the scriptures for our instruction. And so the book of Esther was written for our instruction. Um, instruction and hope that God will provide the deliverer, even though the enemy is relentless and he's ruthless and he keeps on charging, but we know who the victor is and we do have the victory. So tonight we're going to just be reminded of that and we're so excited. And just as we study that incredible story of Esther, it's just a reminder of God's faithfulness to keep his people and to keep his promises and to fulfill his plan for his people. So Get ready, Jesus is coming back, and in the meantime, we get to live with hope, assuredness, that he's faithful to do what only he can do and what he's promised he will do. So let's pray, and then we'll dig in. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word of truth. We thank you that you have given us so much for our instruction so that we would know truth and that we would live truth and that we would be filled with faith and hope because you are faithful. And so, God, we just look forward to hearing from you. We ask that you prepare our hearts, that we would receive all that you have for us. We ask that you bless and anoint our sister Karen, that you would speak through her. You would encourage us, Lord, that we would um, be convicted in the places that you're nudging Holy Spirit, and that we would respond according to your word and to your will. We love you so much. We're so grateful. Be blessed, be honored, be glorified tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Well, welcome back. Hope you had a nice spring break and studied uh, and enjoyed Easter with your family. Um, if y'all been around and heard me speak uh, uh, or talk to me, you know I like movies, right? I mean, not chick flick stuff, not rom-com stuff. I am an action movie gal, man. I like mysteries. I like spy stuff. I like superheroes. I like all of that kind of stuff. Heroes, save the day, love all that stuff. And uh, I, there, But there's one thing in a movie that I do not like, and that is when the bad guy wins. I cannot stand it when that happens. There's just one uh, movie that Cliff and I, uh, Cliff rented two decades ago, so it's an obscure thing, you probably never heard of it before. It's called Arlington Road. And it was this mystery spy sort of thing where the main character worked at a federal building and these, this family moved in next door to him and they, uh, he started to believe that they were a terrorist cell group that were plotting to blow up his federal building where he worked. And so as the movie goes on, you realize he's right. But no one will listen to him. And so he goes on and on, and they're doing all this subversive stuff, and he's like, hey, you got to believe these, these people are not who you think they are, and, but no one will listen to him. And so he becomes more and more and more obsessed to try to gather information to expose them and uh, to get somebody to listen to him to stop him. And at the end of the movie, what happens is, spoiler alert, uh, is that uh, along with his efforts to try to stop the, this bombing of this federal building, they have duped him, and they have used him as a pawn and uh, so, and, and they had actually, right at the end of the movie, when you know, he's driving up to warn the people that he works with that there's going to be a, a, a terrorist attack today, he realizes that they have planted the bomb in the back of his car, and it explodes right at the end of the movie. It kills him. Everybody works with it, blows up the building. And the last scene is the terrorist family who are packing up to go and do it again. And I'm like, ah! What? <laughs> I was so mad about it, and I hate that movie because the bad guys will win and win. And Cliff always laughs at me when we, he talks about this movie because I have such a strong reaction to it because it's just like so frustrating, right? I tell him, yeah, I know that's the way it is in real life that sometimes the bad guys seem to get get uh, to win, and but I don't go to the movies to see the way it is. I go to the movies to see the way it should be, right? <laughs> it's like, I don't mind if a character has to die, but let it be a noble death, right, where they save the day, or sacrifices for others, and all that kind of stuff, where good wins out over evil. That's what we're looking for, right? And you know why we like that so much, and we gravitate toward those kinds of stories? Because it's the story of God, right? That is the story of God. It's the story that he wrote into the fabric of the universe, and so our souls long for wrongs to be righted and for evil to be vanquished 
And so today we're up to chapter 8 in Esther, and I'll go ahead and give you the spoiler alert here, is that it is a picture of right winning out over wrong. And so, yay, that's, that's where we finally got to in the story of Esther. And now when we left, left, our, left our story uh, two weeks ago, in chapter 7, the evil Haman has been carried off, he's been, he's been exposed, Esther uh, tells Xerxes what's going on, and he is carried out, and he is hung on the gallows that he created for Mordecai. And it seems like maybe that ought to be kind of the end of the story, but it's not. Uh, and that's, so today we're going to see how God continues reversing things in uh, a complete and total reversal of the entire story by the time we get to the end of chapter 8 today. So what is reversal? Um, if you, have, uh, you know, remember English 101, you might not know that a reversal, the Greek word is Peripatia, and that's our English 101 word there, and it is a sudden and unexpected, often ironic change of fortune or reversal of circumstances. It's the turning point of the conflict, and now the reversal in Esther's story is not a clever literary device used by the author. It is the divine working of God, and I like to think that, that the literary devices used in stories today are copied from great stories like this that God wrote uh, down for us and that he crafted. So the peripatia, or reversal, in this book started in the last chapter. It'll wind up in the first part of chapter 9, but we'll see everything that was done by uh, Haman in his plot to destroy the Jews is undone and set right. And so if you remember last time, Xerxes' anger subsided when Haman was executed. That's what the last verse of chapter 7, is that Haman Haman on the gallows, and then the king's fury subsided. And uh, that kind of indicates what we already know about Xerxes, right? He's not upset about the annihilation of an entire people group. His focus has been on being disrespected by Haman, by uh, who, someone who plotted against him, someone who came close to the queen. That's what he's most interested in. And so once that was over with, once Haman was gone, he... Uh, it was over in his mind, and the anger subsided. But what happens in the next two chapters uh, 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 does it, it, it's changed for Esther. But right at this point in the story, it hasn't changed for Esther because what she's after is the saving of her people. So I don't want to jump too far ahead. We'll just stick with chapter 8, where we're going to see five reversals that happen in the context as this chapter moves Along, and I heard a lesson by Tony Evans, a wonderful preacher. Um, he kind of helped me get my head around this, and but they're right here in scripture, so we're going to go through those. I'm going to highlight what's going on here these five reversals in chapter eight. And the first one is an economic reversal. And verse one says, That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. Now, when a traitor uh, to a Persian king was executed, everything that they owned reverted to the ownership of the king. And that included um, his, his family, his possessions, his money, everything that he had, everything that he owned came back into the control of Xerxes. And of course, Xerxes, being a king, could do what, what he wanted to. And so in this case, Esther was the one who was wrong, uh, wronged in in uh, uh, Xerxes' mind, so he gave ownership of everything that Haman had to her. So now he was a wealthy man, remember, all the way back at the beginning of the story when he suggests this um, plot to Xerxes. He said, you know what, I'll even fund the thing so you don't have to pay for it. And so only a very wealthy man could even suggest such a thing. And you remember at the end of chapter 5 that Haman was bragging about all the great things he had. He had many sons and vast wealth and honor and all those kind of things. So all of that now resides in Esther's possession. So we have a complete economic reversal. Second reversal is a political reversal. In the verse 1 says that Mordecai came into the presence of the king for Esther had told how he was related to her. Now, so just an aside right here, the king now knows how the Esther and Mordecai are related. And that's kind of okay now, uh, because what they both have in common is loyalty to Xerxes. They have both exposed threats to him. And as we've seen in the king's character here, that he doesn't really care about background or anything like, uh, like that. He just cares about himself. And so in very tangible ways, both Esther and Mordecai have shown their devotion to the king. 
Verse 2 says, The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai, and Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. And so here we have Esther now gives Mordecai the authority to manage everything that was Haman's as in her possession, but he's not just the estate manager. Remember the significance of the, the signet ring that Haman had is that it allows him the authority to make rules, make laws, and do things with the king's authority. So he has lots of political power now, and he acts, in, in, you know, he can write laws, he can stamp it with it, and it's just it's the same as if the king wrote it himself. So that political power that had been over here in Haman's ha hands has now completely shifted and been given to Mordecai. You remember the story of Joseph in the uh, book of Genesis. This is kind of what happened to him. Remember, he was in the dungeon, and then just in a matter of a few hours, he was raised, went before Pharaoh, and then he was put in charge and to be second in command. Same thing happened here. Early in the day, Haman has a target on Mordecai, uh, and it was over for him as far as it looked like from a horizontal perspective. And just in a few hours, he's elevated, he's given the signet ring, and he's elevated to almost second in command and manager of probably the largest estate in the kingdom of Persia besides Xerxes himself. So here the role reversal between Haman and Mordecai is now complete. Uh, what Haman had planned for Mordecai, death on a gallows, now became Haman's fate. And all that belonged to Haman is now given over to the control of Mordecai. And this is the power of God, right? He can change things anytime, any place, anywhere, and that includes politics and all the things that gets us so worked up in our day and time, right? So we mm -hmm. act like people who do wrong and are operating without consequence, and that is not true. Daniel chapter 2 says God changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and he deposes him. So unequivocally, scripture affirms that God is the one who raises up rulers and authorities and kingdoms. He opens the door for one. He closes the door for another. And no authority, not any authority anywhere, rises without the knowledge and involvement of our creator. I spent months uh, last year, and back into the previous year, reading the books of Kings and Chronicles, and what those books remind us is that God uses good rulers like David, Josiah, Hezekiah to lead his people, but he also allowed rulers like Ahab, Zedekiah, and a whole lot of other bad kings to rule for his purposes as well. And he allowed people to be his people to be conquered and ruled by Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Rome, and yet, in the midst of it all, God was in control. Uh, he worked his purposes and his plans, when sometimes it doesn't make any sense to us, but he is in control. Ne and never is he out of control. That doesn't mean we're always going to understand what he's doing or why he allows things to, to, uh, to unfold the way they do, but it does mean that when we, we can trust that even when we don't know the details, we can trust the God who does. Right? And so we should never forget that God can change things instantly if he wants to, just like in this story. So don't ever worry about someone is getting away with something. You don't need to rage over politics either. If there's someone who is elected, <coughs> would you like them or not, they are ruling under the sovereignty of God always, and you can rest in that. That gives us rest and peace when we know that God is ultimately in control, right? So pray, intercede, vote, do all the things that you can do and you have the privilege to do, but don't argue, don't rage, don't be afraid. It is all subject to him and he does what he pleases for his purposes every single time. You know, and this relates far beyond uh, just us thinking about political power and, and our little kingdom here in the United States. Our arch enemy, the devil, is currently the ruler of this world, isn't, mm -hmm. isn't he? That's what the Bible tells us. Um, he is evil, and he is bent on our destruction, just like Haman was. Uh, but we know from various places in Scripture that at the end of time, the one who is seeking our destruction will himself be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And all that belongs to him will be transferred into uh, 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 our, our rule. Uh, somewhat of our rulership. And this is what the verses say. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, and 25 says, The end will come, and when he, Jesus, hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed what? 
all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So that's a word, right? Revelation 2.26, to him who overcomes, that's talking about Christians, and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nation. So we as faithful children of God, we're not honored yet. We don't have this uh, power yet, and we don't have this authority yet. Satan may still be ruling the world, but don't be despair. Remain faithful, like it says in Revelation. Time is coming when all will be set right. Our faithfulness to God matters. Our commitment to Christian living will be rewarded according to God's infinite benevolence. So rest. Don't rage. Rest in what he's promised us. So we had economic, and then, we, and then we're on to legal reversal. Esther then pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agai, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the golden scepter to Esther as she arose and stood before him. And you're like, okay, wait a minute, what's the golden scepter showing up again? Isn't she just standing there talking to him? Why, what's going on there? Because remember we learned back before the golden scepter is extended when somebody comes into his presence without being invited. And so... Um, you would be right. You know, she, that's exactly what's happening here. It might be a little bit confusing, but there is a time lapse of almost two months between Esther chapter 8, verse 2, and 3. Now, how do you know it's two months? Well, you know that all the events of Esther chapter 3 through chapter 7 happen in about the time span of a little over a week. In the first month, the month of Adam, that's when the edict is handed down by Haman, Remember, and that's when the Jews start mourning in sackcloth and ashes out in the streets. And then uh, Haman, I mean, uh, Mordecai goes to Esther and says, this is your t for such a time as this. And then they fast and pray, and then she goes in. So that all happens really fast, chapters 3 through 7. And then, but if you see here, by the time he, she, they talk to, uh, to Xerxes here, verse 9 says, when they start to put this new law into effect, we'll get to it in a second, that it is on the 23rd day of the third month. So we have a time lapse here. And so here's probably how it went. You have to read between the lines a little bit. We don't know for sure. But so Haman is killed at the end of chapter 7. Mordecai is honored in verse 2 of chapter 8. And so everybody goes home happy thinking, okay, this is, the, you know, he's gone. And, you know, Mordecai's got all this power. And Esther's got all this this stuff now, and uh, the king, when they're thinking, well, they're waiting on the king to do something to fix this, because that, that was Esther's re request. It's like, save me, save my people. And so we're waiting for the king to, ha to uh, do something, and then two months pass by, and that the, the fateful day in December is coming, and they're like, okay, and now they're starting to get nervous. Is he going to do something? And so finally Esther decides to go into the king again, and she apparently goes to him unsummoned, like it says in verse 3 that we saw. Verse 4 tells her that he extends the scepter to her, and she asks again. So we're back to verse 5, and then she goes, goes on with all the pleasantries at the beginning. And then she asks again, reminds him of her original request, Let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman's son of Hamadatha of Agai devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. How can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see this destruction of my family? So she's desperate again, kind of going in there, reminding him. Remember, we talked about this before. Nothing's happened. And so basically, this is what Xerxes says. won't read all this. But he basically says, okay, I got rid of Haman. I gave you Mordecai the signet ring. You have the authority. I don't care what you do. Just go do it and take care of it. So he doesn't want to be bothered by this anymore. He says, I've given you everything you need to take care of it. Don't, don't, don't ask me about me anymore. And so, get on down to verse 10, we find out that they come together and they come up with an idea. Verse 10 says, Mordecai wrote in the name of King Xerxes, as he uses his signet ring, uh, the king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves to destroy, kill, and annihilate. If you've been reading along, you'll recognize those words again. They were in Haman's original edict. Any armed forces of any nationality or province that might attack them, their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. So let me explain what's going on here. So Haman wrote that edict against the Jews, put the king's seal on it, 
But it, and it's when the king's seal was on it, man, it couldn't change. You've probably heard the law of the Medes and the Persians. It's a, it's a law that can't be revoked. So just because Haman was dead doesn't mean his law has gone anywhere. And so with Mordecai in charge, they come up with this new law that doesn't strike down the old one, but what it does is it empowers the Jews to be armed and ready so if somebody does come to attack them, they can defend themselves. Not just defend themselves, but they can attack back, killing that family and taking their property. So it basically elevates the Jews to be able to do the same thing that he, Haman's edict uh, let the Persians do. So now, imagine you're a Persian, you're living uh, near a Jewish family, and when you heard about Haman's law, you're like, okay, this is awesome. I like his cattle, I like his land. He's got a you know, a lake on his property, and I really want that. So when, you, when I've been given the authority for on this one day, I can kill it, and then it can be my property. It's the king's law, you know, no, no consequences. So, But now, when you hear that there's a new law that has empowered him to then kill you and your family and take your stuff, now maybe you rethink it, right? So that's kind of what the idea was. So this is a reminder to us Today, when the odds seem overwhelming to us, when you're convinced that nothing's, no, thing, nothing is ever going to change, God can change. He gets the final word. He uh, is the defender of his people. And sometimes we as believers give Satan way too much power, way too much credit. And, uh, but this book, the book of Job, stories in the Genesis, accounts from the kings, Joshua, David, uh, plus all of the Gospels and, of course, the book of Revelation, they all tell us and declare to us that Satan is a defeated foe. He doesn't have, the only power he has is what God allowed him to have and the power that you give him in your life. Because his power is really broken in our lives. The Bible says the greater is he who is within us, he who is in the world. And so, uh, you know, we give him power by sin compromise by toying with temptation and but remember he has no power over you unless you grant it to him satan is on a leash by god and only has so much slack and even when it looks like he's winning remember that the powers of evil the powers of this world and the powers of all the rulers that are set up all over the world have no impact on god's power at all he gets the final say and you can once again rest in him. He, every wrong will eventually be righted. Every single one. And so, that's the legal reversal, and then we go on to an emotional re reversal. So, the first 14 says, the couriers riding the royal horses raced out, were on to by the king's command. Edicts was also issued in the citadel of Susa, and we got a description of Mordecai and what he was wearing. But down at the end of this, it says, and the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy and gladness and honor. In every province, in every city, wherever the edict of the king went, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. Now, if you've gone out in the street with an I, a random iPhone interviews out in the streets of Susa, right one hour before this new law was read, I bet you'd have said, so how do you feel? I bet you'd have got a lot of despair hopelessness and gloom about their fate. We don't know this, you know, the end of the year is coming. This is, there's no way we're going to be, be saved and all that kind of stuff. But see how quickly all of this changed? So quickly, no indication, no warning that anything but destruction was going, that was going to come. But God stepped in with his plan. And this is why it is so dangerous to make long-term decisions based on what the future looks like right this minute. Because it can change. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. We often think about that when somebody says that, we think about that in the negative, that, oh, it might get bad. But you don't know what, what God might change in your life. and Because he is behind the scenes. That's what we've seen all through the book of Esther, is that he is behind the scenes working to bring about things like Ephesians 3.20 says that are beyond imagination. I love that verse. It's like you can't even think up the things that God is working on our behalf. And all of the Gospels give testimony to this. There are beggars and blind people and sick people and all kinds of people there, sinners of all kinds, 
that all they could see was the future of same, 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 nothing's ever going to change, this is the way I'm going to be, but which one of them could imagine that on one day they would ha have an encounter with God in the flesh and they would walk away healed, forgiven, and whole. One day it was all going this way, we can't see anything else, and then so very quickly it all changed. And uh, this is what Jesus did then, and this is what Jesus does today. He makes whole, he restores, and he makes complete. And what happened in Esther this day happens today as well. He turns sorrow into joy. Look at Psalm 30, verse 11. You turn my wailing into dancing. Remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy. That verse right there could be in Esther, right? That's just what would happen. They were wailing, they were in sackcloth, and he turned it around to dancing and joy. That my heart may sing to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. So that was... Um, on to our last reversal. It's a spiritual reversal. And the last verse says, and many people of other nationalities became Jews because the fear of the Jews had seized them. And this is really interesting. Uh, to say these people became Jews expressly meant that they uh, believed in the God of the Jews. Not, not that just they adopted their practices or that they you know, did business like they did or anything like that. <laughs> and mostly, but mostly the word that you see for Jewish converts is a different word. They don't just call them Jews. They call them proselytes. So there's a different word, and that distinguishes them from natural-born Jews and Jewish converts. And so there's a different word that's used. used. But under, in the 256 times that the word Jew or Jews appears in the New American Standard Version, Esther 8.16 is the only instance when people of other nationalities are given the designation for natural-born Jews. So that's what they're saying there, that this is such a radical transformation. So the idea here is that these dramatic reversals, everything that's going on here, the people living in Persia or people who were occupied by the Persians across the whole land of the Persian Empire saw God working on the behalf of the Jews in such a dramatic way. His, his movements were unmistakable that they wanted to align with him. God's activity was so evident that they gave him glory and that lots of Persians committed their lives to the one true God, the God of the Jews. So when God works, don't be silent. Don't, don't keep it to yourself. Make sure you give him the credit because people are watching. And who knows, the work he's doing in your life might not be primarily for you. Well, yes, he gets you know, work in you, right? But he might be working for somebody else who's watching. And uh, it is almost never for a singular purpose that God works. It's multifaceted. Uh, so uh, some of you may have heard me tell this story before. It's a really good one. It fits right here, so I'll tell it again. Uh, uh, our, we were in a Bible study. My husband and I were Bible study in another church many years ago. And it was a young, uh, marriage, uh, a young marriage class. It was a big class. So once a month, they would get a couple up or a, somebody who started coming to the class and uh, would inter could do a little mini interview just so we could get to know each other. And, and uh, so one week they got this couple up there and Mark was the husband. And one of the questions they asked was, how, do you come, how did you come to faith in Jesus? How did you end up at the church here? And so he just pointed to the back of the room, uh, back there in the back, and he said, it's because of Robert. And so he said, we work together and uh, there was an economic Shake up going on at the time, and they didn't know whether the company was going to survive. He said everybody at the company was crazy upset. They were all just, just you know, every day was doom and gloom and worry and grumbling and complaining and all this kind of stuff, you know, all the time, except for Robert, Mark said. And he said, and one day I just went to him and I said, So, aren't you worried about what's going on in the company? You're the only one who's not acting crazy. <laughs> And he said, well, yes, I am concerned about my job. He said, but I'm a Christian, and I know that no matter what happens, that God's going to take care of me, and he will give me the strength and the peace to get through it. And he, and Mark said, I had never heard of anybody who had faith like that, that, would, that actually translated into how they behaved in a, in a stressful situation. And he said, so I asked if I could come to his church because I wanted to have what he had. And so he came to church, he got saved, his wife got saved, and both his kids got saved. And their love 
were transformed. All because one guy was walked out his faith and lived out his faith in an economic uh, shakeup at his company. Wow, <laughs> I mean, that is powerful, right? It's like, because the thing is, you don't know who's watching you. And so if you uh, fall into the hole and the trap that everybody else does of grumbling and complaining, then we don't look any different than anybody else. And so there's nobody to say, why are you different? What do you have that I, that I, I, can, that I can have? And so the takeaway from this chapter is, very simple, I've been dancing all around it, is that God is a God reversal okay wish i could tell you that a life of faith and jesus would always be free from pain and suffering and there wouldn't be any down <laughs> turns or hardships or disappointments but that i can tell you that that is not true and if you've ever heard anybody say that they are on tv everywhere you look and there's whole denominations that will tell you this that if you just have enough faith everything's going to work out the way you want but i'm going to tell you that that is a lie it is not in this book it is not in scripture that is not what it says in fact Scripture tells you over and over and over that hardship is coming, pain is real, suffering is part of the Christian life, but let me tell you what it also says. Those things that hurt and disappoint and frustrate and make you cry, those things do not have the final word in your life. They don't. And you remember I said last time we talked about it that Old Testament stories are pictures of New Testament realities? This chapter right here is a picture, a foreshadowing of the greatest reversal of all time in all eternity. And it is our promise and it is our hope. God has the final word. God is a God of reversal and the greatest reversal that ever happened was on the cross at Calvary. This isn't just a thing we celebrated last week and we celebrate once in the spring and then we go on and don't think about it again until next year. This is our hope. This is our hope. Satan thought he thought he, uh, he had defeated Jesus on the cross. That he had dealt the biggest blow to the plan of God. Now, if you were a disciple in that moment, don't you know that your faith would be crushed? You're standing there watching the, the, the one you had given your whole life to, hanging lifeless on a cross. <laughs> and, and, and they had believed. They had trusted. They had given up everything, and now he was dead. From their perspective, there was no coming back from this moment, right? They were crushed. It was over as far as they believed. But what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good, the saving of many lives. It looked like Satan had won, but the story was not over. <laughs> On the third day, God broke open that tomb, and Jesus walked out. And just when it seemed to be darkness, darkest, God came on the strongest. I mean, everything's going to work out the way you want it to on this earth. No, it does not. <laughs> of course not. Everybody knows it. Everybody can stand up and give testimony to that. Of something in your life that you know personally. But we what we want, because what we want is often flawed in our own thinking, right? We don't know what we want. We don't know the right things to ask for. Because God is often doing, accomplishing stuff through our hardships and difficulties that we couldn't possibly imagine. Remember Peter, Garden of Gethsemane. He tried to stop Jesus. He stepped in to save Jesus, right? Not ever realizing that he was the one who needs saving, mm. right? And he had to, and he was, it was going to be accomplished by allowing the unthinkable to happen. So we, we, what need, we need to realize, because what we see right now is limited by space in our world-centered viewpoint. But let me tell you, there's so much going on in every event of your life that we cannot understand and grasp in this moment. God wastes nothing, and God never loses anything. If you want a real-life person to tell you about this, talk to Leah Petrashko. She will tell you that at the deepest, darkest moment of heartbreak and sadness, God has birthed life and brought forth things that she could never imagine were impossible. God's not finished with her story yet. Her story goes on, and so does Constantine's. Okay? God is the only one who can reverse the effects of the worst possible moment of our lives. Even in death and despair, God births life and hope. And he changes everything. It is his, the best thing that he does, and he does it all the time. So whatever's happened to you, believe that he reverses. Believe that he restores. He's the only one can, who can do that. You can count on it. 
It may not be to eternity till you understand what he is fully doing, but you need to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. What you see here with your eyes is not always all that's going on. Believe that. Hang on to Jesus. Don't make short-sighted decisions without factoring in that fact. Well, let me end with my favorite Easter verse that is not really an Easter verse, most, most people think, but weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Mm. Just love that. It might not be tomorrow morning, but one day when Jesus returns, splits the sky, he will set everything right. And in an instant, sorrow, fear, anxiety, dread that consumes us now will be erased just like that, like it was for the Jews in Persia. God can reverse anything. He always has the last word. Trust in that. Believe that and know it and let it carry you to the bright hope of the new morning that is coming. Amen? Amen. Amen. God, we just thank you that you are a God of reversals. And I pray that uh, as these ladies sit right here in this room right now, you know every detail of every situation that they are facing. You know uh, the heartaches, the heaviness, the concerns, and uh, that they might have issues that are economic, legal, emotional, spiritual. All of these things are under your control. Remind them that of that tonight, Lord, that there's nothing outside of your ability to transform and change. And God, would you please give us the patience to wait on you to work? Because uh, we're so impatient. We want it right now. But God, you're unfolding and doing things that we cannot ever imagine. Help us to trust. Help us to believe. For it's in your mighty son's name we pray.